I'm very excited to welcome back guest HG Tudor, who's been kind enough to come back on. And this is a man whose work I can honestly say has helped me immensely in my own healing process from narcissistic abuse, which we covered in the last interview. So how are you doing, HG? I'm very well, Doug. Thank you very much for inviting me back. Pleasure to be here. Thanks for coming back on. Could you please introduce yourself to the audience who may not be familiar with who you are and what you do? Certainly. Uh, my name is H.G. Tudor. That's pseudonym. Uh, my real identity needs to remain hidden for what are obvious reasons. I'm a narcissistic psychopath as diagnosed as such. I have a private and professional life, but on, alongside that, what I do is I explain to people through various platforms, my YouTube channel, uh, Knowing the Narcissist, H.G. Tudor the Ultra, and a blog, Knowing the Narcissist, and Facebook, etc., all about the perspective of narcissism so that people understand the way that my kind think and act to get rid of the many myths and misunderstandings that are associated with it and to give people the accurate information so they can make decisions based upon that uh, correct and useful information. I explain the way that my kind think and operate, the way that we see the world, the way that we see our victims, um, because I understand my victims and those similar to me inside out. I convey all of this to people so that they can then use that for their further education and to achieve freedom from ensnarement. Thank you for that. And by the way, uh, to the audience, this guy has written over 50 plus books on the subject. He has a YouTube channel where he pumps this material out five, six videos a day. He writes a blog. He does all sorts of things. And I'm going to leave description in the description box. I'm going to leave links to his website, narcsite.com, as well as how you can avail yourself of the other information, because this guy has a plethora of knowledge if you're interested in this subject. So, with that in mind, uh, here's the first question, HG, and it's kind of a four-parter, so we okay. can break it. We can break it down bit by bit if this is too much. But here it is. So, first of all, what exactly is a narcissist, and what are some of the characteristics and behaviors of a narcissist? Why are they dangerous, and why do people need to become made aware of this particular disorder? Why are, is it even important that we're talking about this today? Okay. So what is a narcissist? Well, a narcissist is an individual who has narcissistic personality disorder. People often think that there's a spectrum of narcissism. There isn't. You are either a narcissist or you're not. And somebody who is a narcissist is somebody who has narcissism. And it is somebody that has narcissistic personality disorder. What does that mean? There are different types of narcissists. Some are quite obvious in their behaviours, some are very subtle. And there are a range of different narcissists which I classify, and you'll find more about that through my books and on my channel and blog, as mentioned. But what we all have in similarity is that we have no emotional empathy whatsoever. So we have no empathic traits. There's no honesty. If we are honest, it's fabricated for our own purposes. So we have no emotional empathy. We manipulate. We pursue the prime aims. Prime aims are fuel. Fuel is our lifeblood. And this is the emotional response provided by a person provoked by our activity. So if somebody says, I love you, HG, They've just given me some positive fuel. If somebody bakes me a Victoria sponge cake, that gesture provides me with positive fuel. And there are lots of examples. And if you want to understand more about that, you can learn more in my book, Fuel. We also seek to control everybody that is in our fuel matrix. If you come upon our radar, we must control you. We seek character traits from you bits and pieces of your achievements and character and who you are, which we take for ourselves and utilize. And we seek residual benefits. That might be money. It might be great sex. It might be a roof over our heads. It might be the creation of a facade that you contribute to. It might be access to your uh, networks, people that you know. 
So those four things constitute the prime aims, fuel, character traits, control, and residual benefits. All narcissists want that. The difference is that most narcissists don't know what they are, and therefore they don't know that they manipulate. Many people struggle to understand that concept, but they don't. Some narcissists are conscious and aware and calculated. I'm one of them, but I'm not the only one. But we are rare. The majority of narcissists, and mainly the ones that most people will have some interaction with, are unaware. Some know that they cause problems, but don't care. And some realize that they cause difficulties, but it's justified in their minds because they're never to blame. But all narcissists share in common a lack of emotional empathy, a pursuit of the prime aims, and they are manipulative. Then we have differences in terms of level of intelligence, the utilization of different manipulations, how much charm might be exhibited, levels of success, consciousness as to what's going on, whether a facade is used. Some narcissists don't use a facade. So there are core principles which are applicable to what a narcissist is, and then there are variations on a theme. Now, why is it important to understand about narcissism? Well, most people will have been touched by narcissism at some point in their lives. Some people will have been touched in a direct way. Their parent or parents were narcissists. They may have met one in a romantic entanglement. And most people come across narcissism as a consequence of those two arenas, the romantic and the familial. And that's where they first find that they have been ensnared by a narcissist and it leads to them understanding that that was narcissism. But narcissism also manifests in a social environment. You may have a friend who's one, or more than one, a neighbour, a boss, a colleague. Then we have what I call the everyday narcissist. If you want to understand more about this, there's a recent video on my YouTube channel about it. That individual who is a very, very difficult customer of yours, who you can't please, who threatens to um, rat on you to your boss, no matter how often you demonstrate to them that the problem isn't that of your company and they've caused the mistake, they won't accept it. It's likely you're dealing with a narcissist. The individual that behaves in an entitled manner, pushing people out of the way in a line, demanding that they're served ahead of everybody else, rude, obnoxious, likely to be a narcissist. The concept of the Karen that has been created, that's a narcissist. Unfortunately, it leads to people being labeled as Karens when they're not actually, but the Karen is a form of narcissist. And so the everyday narcissist that appears are the ones that you might not be entangled with in a romantic way or a familial way, but you still have to deal with them. It's the awkward individual that runs a restaurant or a particularly uh, odious client of yours. It might be a teacher that you have to have some involvement with with regard to your children. It might be the parent of uh, a child who's in your child's class. It might be a police officer, a council official. Politicians, of course, many are narcissists. And in a, in a way, everybody is affected by that. Not directly. You don't know the politician. You've never met them. But the behaviors of that politician, the decisions, and what they do impact upon you. Narcissism pervades all levels of society, but many people don't realize that that's the case. And as a consequence, they fall into the trap of trying to deal with certain behaviors, not knowing what it is that they're actually dealing with. And therefore, they make mistakes. And therefore, it's very important for people to understand what narcissism is, both in a personal capacity of interpersonal relationships and then in a wider sense within a societal setting. Because when you understand what it is and you understand how it operates and how it impacts upon you and other people, those nearest to you, you learn that you then have to avoid these individuals or minimize your involvement with them. And... It's like being given a key of understanding that hitherto, when you're worried about, I just don't know how to deal with this person, no matter how many times I try and get them to understand my position, they just don't listen. And you get upset and worked up about it. You now realize 
this person's a narcissist. No matter what I tell them, they can't see it from my perspective because they alter from a different perspective. And therefore, I have to obey the first golden rule of freedom, which is once I know, I go, I get out, and I stay out. The principle of go so. You don't try and persuade the narcissist. You don't try and appeal to our better nature. We don't have one. You don't threaten the narcissist. You don't cajole the narcissist. You realize, I must have nothing to do with that individual. In some instances, it's easier to implement than others, but it can always be done. And my work provides you with the tools to achieve that. So that's why it's very important to know about what narcissism is. Thank you for that. That was a fantastic breakdown. And the reason I'm nodding my head constantly when you're talking about what you just said is because you just described my mother. And that took me forever to figure out that this person is not going to change. I tried forever and I tried everything until I came yeah. across your work. This person's a narcissist and everything fucking clicked, just like you said, about it's be like being given a key to mm -hmm. um, human behavior and your life and your sanity. Mm -hmm. Mm. You're absolutely right. Um, people don't know what they're dealing with. And what happens is they believe that the person that they are having the difficulty with sees the world in a similar way. Exactly. So when you have a dispute, you think, if I explain my position, show willingness to listen to the other person, uh, offer compromise and solutions, we can resolve this dispute. The problem is you're not talking to somebody like you. They are set so that they see the world through a lens of control. And it's a very simple lens. Although most narcissists don't know this is how they see the world, they see it this way. You are either giving me control or you're threatening it. Every single thing that you do with that person, every single interaction you have with them, everything you say to them is viewed in their unconscious, where they're un unaware narcissist, through that lens of control. You buy them a bunch of flowers, you are signaling that you're giving them control. You're painted white, there isn't a problem. You ask them where they've been because they're late. You're now threatening their control. You're painted black. You ask them, why are you being mean to me? They don't see that they're being mean to you, but your suggestion that they are being mean threatens their control. You're now painted black. When you say to the narcissist, I love you, you're absolutely wonderful. You're signaling that you're giving them control and therefore there isn't a problem. Every single interaction you have goes through this filter and on the other side comes out as either giving control, you're painted white, or you're threatening control, then you're painted black. The best thing to do is not to have to go through that filter at all, staying away from the narcissist. Now you tell me that, HG, I have suffered so much from what you just described and you just described it perfectly. I can attest that that is exactly true, what you just said. It's so simple. It's all about control. And I simply had no idea what I was dealing with with my cult leader and my mother. Yeah. Oh, man. It's frustrating, too, by the way, my man, to come across your work in my late 30s when I could have yeah. saved a lot of trauma and a lot of, um, I can't even describe to you the trauma and heartache I could have avoided if I would have just come across your work when I was a teenager. But you weren't around then, so I guess that would have been impossible. But you know what well, I mean. Well, indeed. And it is a refrain that I hear on a daily basis. If only I could met your work five years earlier, HG. Yep. If only you'd been around 10 years ago for me to know this. And it's understandable. But the point is, I explain to people, that's the past. You can't do anything about it. You have to deal with it now. And what you should say is, thank goodness I'm able to access it now. The years that you spent entangled with the narcissist and all the repercussions that has for you, they've happened. Mm -hmm. It is a considerable weakness of human beings that they have a preoccupation with the past. We don't have time travel. You can't go back and undo mm -hmm. it. Therefore... You have to accept this is what has happened. Those events have come to pass. They've impacted on me, but I'm now drawing a line in the sand and refusing to allow them to impact upon me anymore. And that's what must be done to harness it in now. Thinking about what happened in the past, whilst it's understandable, and I know you make the point just to reference that uh, lament, and to do so in a one-off basis isn't problematic, but to remain fixated with thinking, oh, if only it could have been different. Well, it hasn't been. So you must deal with it. And the way to deal with it is by the application of my work, gain your understanding. And then you've got many years ahead of you that you will be narcissist free. And that's what you need to focus on. 
not what you've lost, what you're about to gain. Exactly. A narcissist free if you go through what you're teaching about, because it's not always easy. Like I had a mother that, you know, I literally had to cut out of my life and not, yeah. by, not vice versa. It took me a long time to understand that. And additionally, HG, you know, I don't regret my own personal experience uh, just because I'm sure you've heard this a lot, too, from your from the people that you deal with that have been wounded. Uh, if I hadn't been ensnared by a narcissist or had the kind of experiences that I did, I can't say that I didn't learn a lot from it about life in general and about uh, myself. So in a weird way, by being um, wounded or entangled with the situations, it perhaps gave me life lessons and a deeper understanding of human behavior that I don't think would have come about otherwise, which is a really weird and paradoxical thing to say. But do you understand what I'm what I'm saying? Have you ever I do. Heard? I think most people would say they'd ra still rather not have to have gone through it to totally. gain that understanding. But since you did have to, you, yes, you're right to look for the proverbial silver lining, and it's a large one, which is you understand more about yourself you understand that none of it was your fault, um, even though your emotional thinking will try and tell you that it is. And it will also enable you to understand going forward. Right. Now, you see, what's quite common is that people come to me and they invariably say, I think, uh, I think I'm involved with a narcissist, boyfriend, girlfriend, spouse. And they do the NARC detector. They find out that they are. I help them move on and implement their no-contact regime and stick to it. And then it dawns on them. They come back to HG. I, I think my mother might be one. And I think there's a friend in my social group who's one. And I think my boss is one. And they suddenly think, well, I, I seem to be seeing them everywhere. Surely that's not right. And it is right. Because if you're an empath, you draw us to you like moths gather to the flame. And so you will have more than one narcissist in your life in those interpersonal relationships. And then, as I explained in the early stages of this discussion, that you have interactions with them on, uh, on a wider basis. And when you learn to be able to spot our kind and you understand that you don't go about trying to bring us down, you don't go about trying to heal us or persuade us that we ought to adopt a different course, you evade your life becomes far richer for it because you're not wasting time on somebody that's only going to become a drain on it. You're not pouring emotion, time, energy, money into that pit and you're not being thrown up in the air and spun around. You're not being punched in the face. You're not having your self-worth eroded. You're not wasting time and energy, etc., on this individual. And that's what it's all about. Identification and then evasion. Exactly. Nailed it again. Uh, this is a question that might be a little controversial. I yeah. had it on my mind based on what you said on our last interview, and I'm just going to ask it. I'm not, um, I just don't want the audience to freak out over this next question. So give me, um, give me about 45 seconds to read through this. Cause I, I want to, I wrote it down and then okay. I just wanted, I just wanted to hear your response on this from a perspective of a narcissistic psychopath, someone who knows yeah. what they're talking about. So you mentioned in our previous discussion that narcissists are overrepresented in positions of power, be it the government by rising through the ranks in a particular profession. Uh, through seeking fame and fortune, etc., as well as in the family unit itself. So having come out of a cult myself, you know, I was born and raised in Scientology and yes. having studied for years about the subject of cult and psychopathy and narcissists and how that relates, because I was ruled over by a psychopath, L. Ron Hubbard. Um, I can't help but recognize some of the characteristics, some of them, concerning the global situation and crisis that we're under. We are being isolated to our homes. We must stay six feet apart from one another. We, um, mom and pop shops, which has spent a lifetime being built up, have been destroyed and they're deemed non-essential businesses. Companies such as Walmart, Amazon, liquor stores, and smoke shops are deemed essential. We are being bombarded with one official narrative of what's happening. Alternative narratives are being viciously censored and suppressed on the internet, YouTube. We are repeatedly hearing conflicting and confusing information on what the hell is happening, which is creating confusion and cognitive dissonance in people, perhaps. They don't know what the fuck's going on. Mm -hmm. So we have endless other um deaths occurring from other things besides covid but the homelessness the suicide rate the psychological torture that people have been going through etc that's not necessarily reported on we're just getting covid 24 7 right 
so what I wanted to ask you is, how do we know what the truth is, if it's somewhere in between, or if we're being given the whole truth about the current global crisis by those in power, when you said, rightfully so, that your kind or narcissists are overrepresented, and we know what they do, they lie, they control, etc. So how do we know that we're not experiencing some version of perhaps a global gaslight where this situation might be, ta be taken advantage of to implement more and more control over the population? Or are we being told the truth? You understand what I'm asking, right? Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, if there is this idea that there is this orchestrated, um, coordinated decision to dupe the world's population as far as possibly can, that um, the simple answer to that is no, because that presupposes that all of the relevant leaders are all going to work in tandem together, and they, and they won't. Why? Because many of them are narcissists, and if one exactly. narcissist does A, the second narcissist thing will perceive that as a threat to his control and will reject it. A little example of that appertains to the European Union. Boris Johnson, narcissist. Mm -hmm. For those who don't know, Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. Angela Merkel, the Chancellor of um, Germany. And Emmanuel Macron, who is the President of France. Those individuals, all three are narcissists. Do they act in tandem to keep the EU together? No. Boris leads Britain out of the European Union. He did what was best for Boris. So there's an example of three narcissists that are in a position of power and haven't acted in tandem. Now, try and multiply that by all the nations on earth. And no matter what people might like to think, that there is somehow this darkened room that's akin to this spectre organization from James Bond, where people sat around going, blah, blah, blah. What are the reports from South America? How many countries have you got under control? Controller number three. It doesn't work like that. The difficulty is, is that with many of these things, that in order to implement them, there are too many other competing narcissists. So the whole idea of there being this entire global conspiracy is immediately going to fall because narcissists don't all act together. Indeed, inherent in their narcissism is the very fact that they'll fight against it because it will be perceived by them as a threat to their control. Now, breaking it down on a national level, certainly narcissists will take advantage of the situation to achieve what they want to do. So where there is this information that um, a virus has occurred, certain narcissists will utilize it as an opportunity to implement the prime aims, obtaining control, obtaining fuel, character traits, and residual benefits. But they'll do so on a huge scale. Some of those narcissists will use the existence of the pandemic to suggest there is nothing to be worried about. This virus will soon send it packing. Don't worry. Um, we don't need to do anything. It's largely made up, and therefore, don't concern yourself. That narcissist asserts control by telling the populace, nothing to see here, don't worry about it. Another narcissist utilizes it as, we must take immediate action to ensure that you're all protected. And now we're going to curtail all of these behaviors. Remember, many of these narcissists are unaware, and they don't know that they're doing it for the purposes of asserting control, they think they're doing it for benign reasons. There'll be other narcissists that do see it as an opportunity for them to control the populace, and it's a very convenient occurrence. So no matter where you might stand on to, uh, about the existence of the threat that's posed by it, because, of course, there'll be those that will say this. This is a disease that you have a 99% recovery rate from. So why is it then that everything economically has to be shut down? Why do you have to have all of these controls being in place? Why not shield the people who are particularly vulnerable, those with underlying conditions and the elderly, and let everybody else get on? That's what we do every other flu season, isn't it? So why don't we do the same here? 
And of course, it's because it's a new variant and it provides an opportunity for certain narcissists to utilize it one way or the other to deny its existence or to harness its existence for the furtherance of their own agendas. But remember, many of those narcissists don't know what they are, so they think they're doing something right for a different reason. I am protecting our country against the threat posed by this virus. Of course, others are doing it for reasons of preserving the health system. And so a lot of what is being done may appear to be for altruistic reasons in the sense of protecting uh, people against it, but it's actually being done because the narcissist that's in control is in charge is having to take these steps to prevent the health systems being overrun, because if they are seen to be overrun, that narcissist will then be voted out of power. So it's self-preservation. They might dress it up as, I care about my populace, and many of them will think that way because they're unaware narcissists. But what's actually occurring is it's clinging on to power, and some will do that, utilizing the threat that they see that's posed by it, and others will uh, disregard it. I don't need to tell listeners which of the world leaders have been dismissive about the existence of the uh, virus and how it's impacted on. There's been several that have behaved that way, and then there are others that have gone in the other direction. But like anything that comes along, it will be utilized as an opportunity and an excuse for a narcissist to bend it to their will. This is where, for instance, um, in this instance, it's the existence of a virus. In other instances, it would be scapegoating a particular section of society, the gays, the Jews, the blacks. Certain leaders utilize that by saying, we don't trust them. They're the ones that are taking all the jobs. Therefore, I will triangulate this bit of the populace with that minority over there, scapegoat them and make them appear dangerous because it serves my purposes to do so, so that I can stay in power and exercise it. Thank you very much, man. That was some fascinating insight. Okay, so the next question, I guess, that leads into that is an obvious one. What percentage of the population, if you know, are suffering from narcissistic personality disorder? What are we looking at? It's said that it's a very low percentage, somewhere at about one. It's far higher than that. It's roughly, one in, it's, it's roughly one in six people. It's that, that high. It's that high, HG? One in six. It is. It wow. is. There is, of course, no survey that exists because, of course, if you were to say to somebody, basically, are you a narcissist? Most of them would say no, because they don't know that they are. Exactly. And the difficulty is, is that with many of the surveys that exist online, you, you will only capture some of the narcissists, the more obvious ones, who will answer those surveys in terms of, uh, yes, you know, I, I think that I'm better than I am. Most narcissists mm -hmm. believe they're better than they are. They don't, they don't believe that they are. They know that they are, and they can't see that they actually aren't. So you'd only capture the most obvious ones. And as you know from my work, there's a wide range of different types of narcissists. And that observation of it being one in six is based upon my extensive experience in my life of recognizing my kind and seeing them in terms of in my family, the workplace, in the commercial enterprise that I've been involved in, in political spheres, military spheres, social spheres. And it's borne out time and time again. There are far more narcissists that exist than people realize. We're still a minority. There are, there are way more non-narcissists than there are narcissists, but it's a sizable minority. It's far larger than people realize. That's really important information because my entire life and the statistics themselves say, like you said, 1%, I've heard 3%, I've heard 5%. I think you're, I don't know, but I, your statistics sound a lot more accurate because I think it's a lot more prevalent. I wonder if the narcissists themselves didn't put out that information and data so that, you know, they could be hidden a little bit longer. Well, this is where, this is where it becomes wheels within wheels and a box right. inside another box, which is <laughs> exactly. inside a package and so forth. Exactly. That you're absolutely right that with certain instances that, um, that um, information is provided on the basis of utilizing it to assert control. If I were to come along and say, well, actually, um, 
based upon it being what I, I state that based upon my own extensive experience, it's one in six. If I was to say that to uh, another narcissist who was involved in maintaining that it's one or two percent, I threaten their control. So they'd immediately look to try and poo poo what I say. And it's not because they're doing it from an objective standpoint. They're doing it because what I'm saying is threatening their control. Now, if they pointed to some external evidence that demonstrated that it's only 1%, then one would look at that. But they probably can't. It'll be a, a guesstimate. I think you're absolutely right that it's quite a bit higher. A one in six sounds good to me based on my own experience. But then again, mm -hmm. like you said, maybe an empathic person has a tendency or an attraction towards, you know, pulling that well, in, I, shall we say. Bear in mind, you're absolutely right about that, Doug. But bear in mind, I'm not an empath. And I see mm -hmm. one in six empaths. Right. You'll you'll probably actually see more than that because you draw wow. our kind to you. So um, occasionally, my readers and listeners that, that they're accused of oh, you know, people just throw the word narcissist around like confetti. Right. And there are some people who do that. And I'll tell you who the people are that do it. it tends to be the narcissists accusing everybody else wow. of being narcissists. It's not wow. the genuine victims. They actually are far more cautionary about their use. When I consult with people, I'm worried, HD, that I see them everywhere. Surely that's not right. Well, actually, it stacks up. One, you're an empath. Two, you'll draw a narcissist to you. Three, you become more adept at spotting them. It's like you've been sat in the dark, not knowing what's out there, and somebody's giving you a pair of night vision goggles, and now exactly. you switch them on, you go, fuck me. There's, there's a lot of very frightening things in here, aren't there? I, never, I wasn't able to see them. Now I can. Exactly. And that, that's one of the other questions I wanted to ask you uh, appertaining to that. Um, so the narcissist you, you said, or the empath is, has an addiction or a fascination or a natural attraction to these kind of people. One, could you explain why that is exactly the mechanics of that? And also, does the narcissist therefore suffer in a, a similar addiction or attraction or necessity to ensnare and feed off the emotional content and energy of said empath? We have an addiction to the prime aims. And so the simplest way really is to say that the narcissist is addicted to fuel. We have a necessity for control. We have a necessity for those character traits. And we have a necessity for the uh, residual benefits. And so our addiction is in effect to the prime aims. The empath's victim, um, the empathic victim rather, their addiction is to the narcissist. And empaths all have that. Where that comes from, I set out in one of my logic bulletins, uh, the foundation, which I have a thing called the Knowledge Vault, which has got chock full of material. So if listeners want to understand more about precisely where their addiction comes from, that sets out the basis on how it arises. And there are two foundations for it. Not everybody has two. All empaths have one. And some have two. But if you're an empath, you have that addiction. And that addiction is formed within you. And it formed as a consequence of uh, when you were a child. And then it impacts upon the way that you act, the way that you think, the way that you behave, so that you are caused to interact with narcissists without necessarily realizing that's what you're doing. You're caused to spend time or communicate with us, do things in relation to us, think about us. And your addiction creates something called emotional thinking, which is a con artist. And it basically makes you think you're doing things which are sensible when you're not. So a brief example of that, uh, and I make it slightly absurd to drive home the point, is somebody saying, I have been practicing moving my head backwards and forwards to enable me to put my head in a lion's mouth and whip it out before it bites me. Now, why on earth would you go and want to go and put your head in a lion's mouth? Logically, that's a lion, lions bite you. Therefore, you ought not to go anywhere near it. That's logic. So for you to think, well, because I've been practicing moving my head back and forth very quickly, that means I can stick my head in the lion's mouth without risk of a downside. Well, first of all, what upside is there to doing that? The ability to show off that you can move your head back and forth? Well, that's a valuable life skill, isn't it? Good luck with that. But moreover, there's a horrendous downside because that lion will bite you. Maybe not the first time you stick your head in, but certainly on the fourth, maybe the 10th, maybe the 32nd, you'll be bitten because that's what lions do. 
And therefore, to think that you can stick your head in there without consequence and keep doing so, that is emotional thinking. It is not logical. Emotional thinking operates in the same way. It makes the empathic victim think that what they're doing is sensible when it's not. For instance, I need to get answers to understand what's happened to me. I'll go and ask the narcissist why they're treating me this way. No, that's emotional thinking. I need to bring the narcissist down. I need to uh, kick his peasy ass. No, that's causing you to then uh, enter into um, emotional thinking. And that is not a, uh, a logical step. And there are ways of managing this logical, this emotional thinking that manifests from the addiction. And my work sets out how to do it. You can't get rid of your addiction as part of who you are, but you can certainly manage it. You need to understand where it comes from, how it impacts upon your old behaviors, and then utilize the techniques that I provide you with to manage that addiction. And then you get it down to you get your emotional thinking down such a, down to such a low level that what happens is you don't give in to the addiction and you spot narcissists before it's too late and you evade, as I mentioned earlier. This is such an ongoing process too, what mm -hmm. you're talking about. And it, you nailed it. It's, I'm still dealing with this today, despite knowing what I know. It is that emotional thinking that you're talking about, my man. And even though I might know better, I've been trying to hone down that logic because I just can't not fall for it. Like you said, it's, it's yeah. with, it's with us, you know? Yeah. Um, and I would tell the audience, you know, if you're having similar troubles, like this is a really major point that he made. I can just tell you from personal experience, having to, what he said is true, that it's a constant battle against your emotions, justifying why it's okay to go stick your head in a lion's fucking mouth. And I keep still to this day doing it repeatedly. It's a constant logic learning process. Um, anyway, so one of the things that you brought up too, my man, is that, and I've noticed this as well, is that a lot of narcissists, and this might be part of why they can ensnare people so easily, is they have a charisma or a certain magnetism or a certain charm about them. The first person that comes to my mind, based on my cult experience, is Tom Cruise. People think that this is a loving, caring man. He's got this classic smile. He's very uh, magnanimous and magnetic. And they don't realize the Dr. Jekyll side of this man. If only they knew, right? I think that's a line, a line from um, Eyes Wide Shut, you know, from Nicole Kidman. If only you people knew. This man's mm -hmm. a, psych a psychopath and, uh, or a narcissist, whatever. He's uh, not who he seems. So I was wondering, how come people f fall for that and they can't kind of see beyond that mask, which to me is obvious? And then also, where the hell does this charisma come from? Why with someone with such a damaged personality, how can they exude such an energetic uh, field or whatever around them? Well... Why is it that people can't see beyond it? Well, I'll give you an example that pertains to me. Through the work that I do in an online environment, I make it very clear what I am. It's there, plastered over everything that I do, that I'm a narcissistic psychopath. My writings, my videos are all from my perspective as that. I tell you very clearly. And yet there are people that still say, ooh, I'd like a date with HG. I've told you what I do, that I abuse people, that I get off on manipulating. And I tell you all the things that you should look for. And then people say, I would like a date with HG. Now, some people say that from the safety of being several thousand miles away from me and on the other end of an electronic uh, method of communication. So it's a little bit of... Uh, mild flirtation and they don't seriously and they absolutely shit themselves if they simply mm -hmm. realize that I was coming around to pick them up at eight o'clock. But there are others that would embrace that. Many of the individuals that do and that throw themselves at me, they're actually mid-range narcissists that don't know what they are. But that's a discussion for another time because uh, that would take up quite a lot of uh, mm -hmm. uh, discussion. Perhaps that's something to discuss on the next occasion that we speak. Mm -hmm. oh, the reason that many people don't, uh, going back to the example you've provided, uh, many, the reason why people don't see it is because of this product of emotional thinking. First of all, people don't go around immediately thinking, is this person that I'm talking to a narcissist or a psychopath? You mm -hmm. look at this person, they've got two arms and two legs and two eyes, and they right. speak in a similar way to you, mm -hmm. and they, they move and 
behave in a similar way. Therefore, you assume they're like you and you operate with emotional empathy. So it's a reasonable uh, leap to think, well, they must do as well. And of Mm -hmm. course, people don't realize. And of course, like many things, we don't go around with a great big N branded onto our forehead to let you know what we are. Uh, as I often explain, if I sidled up to a lady in a bar and went, hello, my name's H.T. Brown, an autistic psychopath. How do you fancy a dirty martini with me? And most would shriek and say, get away from me, you freak. Uh, I'm terrified. So what I'm, I'm, I'm charming and I'm magnetic and I'm fun and I'm interesting and I'm humorous and I'm well-presented and I'm handsome because that's what draws that person to me. Wow. So many narcissists, not all, because some don't exhibit charm, but those that mm-hmm. do, it's part of the way that their narcissism operates to enable them to catch prey. Why is the lion gold-colored? So he fits in with the grassland and the savanna, so he can't be seen, so that he can grab the antelope. He's not colored purple and green with great big flashing lights on his tail. If he had that, he'd be too obvious. Mm-hmm. We are predators, and therefore we need to be able to fit into our environments. So of our kind fit in by seemingly being very pleasant and caring. The false angels, the overwhelming angels that exist. Others fit in by, yeah, he's just a bit of a rough diamond. He's got a bit of edge to him. They don't realize that all that's happening there is that the real dark side is being just kept under wraps. Probably a lesser narcissist than it's a bronze period that that person's being given. The ones that come along that are full of the razzle-dazzle and enticing and talking 100 miles an hour and are bold and abrash and are fun and exciting and a whirlwind might be an upper lesser type A. That they come and it's, whoa, wow, he's a bit much, but it was great fun. And so that magnetism that exists is just part of who we are. You can have magnetic empaths. Of course you can. But they use their magnetism in a different way. Our magnetism, where it exists, because as I say, not all narcissists have it, the charisma that exists, the patter, the humor, those things which are particularly appealing, that little cheeky glint in the eye, etc. that's what we have been given as part of our narcissism to enable us to ensnare people. Would you say, HG, that that's an unconsciously cultivated aspect to survive and be a narcissist and do well at that profession? (laughs) Or is it something that is used consciously and um, sort of worked upon because to fit in and to ensnare people? Is it something that people they're working on? What it is, is that where those traits exist with your lesser mid-range narcissists, they are used instinctively. They don't cultivate them where you have uh, great masters or ultra, those traits similarly exist, but we recognize why they're there. We understand what they're there for, and we consciously utilize them for that purpose. Now, there are some individuals who might think that they can somehow up their game and polish their game. They tend to be unaware mid-range narcissists who think that they can somehow become Mr. Lover Lover by reading a book about how to pick up women. And they're unaware as to what they actually are. And they think, oh, I'll utilize that and become better at what I do. And they invariably aren't. So, but they will be able to ensnare people in a different way. So that particular narcissist, he might ensnare people through pity plays. He wants to be Mr. Charming. He wants to be the Lothario. He wants to be Charlie Big Bananas. But that's not his style of narcissism. So he can't bolt it on. He can't become that. He'll try and he'll fail. The way that he gets his victims is presenting, oh, my girlfriend doesn't understand me, or, oh, I've had a really tough day at work, and, you know, mum and dad hate me. Pity plays. But there's, there are different types of victims that are catered to by different types of narcissists, you see. Very interesting. And I have to ask you, because we were talking about this briefly before, you know, we started this interview, you know, your voice is quite impressive. And I find myself drawn to the hypnotic quality of your of your incredible voice. And I know that you've heard this a lot from your listeners. Is this something that you were born with and aware of? I'm talking about the charisma that you obviously possess. Is this something that you're aware of and that you've always known? Or is this some, and it's just a natural trait, or could you, could you just tell me more about that? Like where, where you get well, that my from? Charisma is you use it to your advantage and stuff, you know? Yes. My charisma is part of who I am, but it's part of the way that my narcissism has evolved. And it's a weapon in the same way as I have an excellent sense of humor, but it's a weapon. 
in the same way that I'm very competent sexually. And that's a weapon. And I have all of these traits which are utilized for the purposes, and I know that I have them, and I use them to ensnare, to pursue the prime aims, because I'm an aware narcissist. So I have that ability. Some narcissists do not have those things. Others do, and they will be aware that they are uh, quite charming, but they don't see it in terms of utilizing it for the purposes of ensnarement. They just think, yeah, lots of people like me. That's just, the, you know, I'm a likable guy. What can I say? They don't realize that their narcissism is using the, that likability. It's a, a factor of their narcissism. So you'll be familiar with the game Dungeons and Dragons, okay? And you used to have different attributes, strength, dexterity, constitution, wisdom, intelligence, and so forth. And there were different ways of formulating a character. Sometimes you just roll the dice and whatever the dice said, that was your character. Most people didn't like that. And some systems were, you were given a base number of points which you could allocate. So it meant, right, well, if I'm going to go for the, the, um, the warrior, I'm going to have somebody who's strong and he's got an iron constitution, but I'm going to have to drop the points on the charismatic side. And he's not that intelligent either, nor has he got much in the way of wisdom. That's where I'll allocate my points accordingly. I can't get 18 across the board. The points were generally between 3 and 18. So, similarly, with the narcissism, it's almost as if the god of narcissism has said, right, with these narcissists, they get those abilities, those traits, those skills, but they don't get those ones. These narcissists over here, they get a different set. And it's almost as if there was a base number of points that's allowed to be allocated towards certain elements. So some narcissists will be given as part of their narcissism, charisma, others don't have it. Some will be magnetic, others don't have it. Some are fast talkers, others don't. Others utilize it in the way of um, appearing very vulnerable, fragile, other narcissists that in their way. Some are, God, he's an arrogant wanker, but I still can't find myself, I can't help be, be drawn to that. I love the way that he exudes confidence. Wouldn't work for everybody, of course. Different type of narcissist again. So the narcissism has different manifestations allied to those traits. For me, my charisma, my magnetism is part of my narcissism. That's the way that it evolved with that intact. My voice of course, I wasn't born sounding that way. That would be one very frightening baby that would speak like this. But um, as my voice broke, and as a consequence of the way that I am, I have this stentorian, authoritative, uh, charismatic voice, which, again, I use as a weapon. I'm well aware of the effect that it has, and I use it to its full advantage. It's one hell of a weapon, my friend. One hell of a weapon. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. This is so interesting what you're saying, my man. Okay. So I just wanted to ask you a personal question, if you don't mind, because, uh, you know, I consider it a rare chance to talk to your kind. So open. That's, all right. That's why I'm here. Thank you. Um, so I just wanted to ask you, do you obviously HG, you well, maybe not tell me, but you wouldn't have a perspective on what it would be like to have a conscience and have the full spectrum of emotional content that a normal or an empathic person would have. Right. So do you like being a narcissistic psychopath? Do you feel like you have a certain advantage or abilities that your poor brethren who you ensnare these people like empaths that can't get over there they can easily be duped by their emotional thinking do you feel from your personal point of view that it's better or there are advantages or certain things that we don't understand about being your kind the world needs people like me i'm not hindered by certain emotions or feelings so that i can do certain things that need to be done which other people would hesitate at without revealing some of the things that I do. It's, uh, I think, as Orwell had mentioned, it's rough men like me that enable people to sleep safe in their beds at night. I'm effective as what I am, and there is no basis for that to change. Indeed, if I were altered, I would not be as effective. And if I were able to realize that that change had occurred, I would not be best pleased about it. I don't need to feel those emotions because I've never had them. So I don't miss that, which I've never had. And I know empaths say, it's terrible HD that you can't feel love. I'm not interested in feeling love. It serves no purpose for where I stand. The ability to feel love only ends up in causing people problems. They end up curled up in the fetal position, crying their eyes out because they've been rejected. 
invariably by one of our kind, of course. But I see that creates weakness. And I know there are people that disagree with me, but from where I am positioned, constitution of what my emotions are, a more limited emotional spectrum, the absence of conscience, the absence of remorse, the absence of guilt, all of those things hinder people forging ahead and making decisions and achieving what needs to be done. It creates hesitation. If you hesitate in certain, in certain instances, it's over, game over. Now, I can't have that. I'm perfectly content with the way that I am. And this is why you might hire in the military, for example, people that don't, that have those abilities, because like you said, an empathic or a normal person would hesitate in a game yeah. where you can't hesitate. Uh -huh. It's very interesting, man. I'm not judging, by the way. I know you don't give a shit either way, but I just find it fascinating <laughs> to just hear your perspective because I'm wired HG kind of against my own will about having a bleeding heart and emotions. And like you said in the last interview, those have been suppressed through my cultic and, and family uh -huh. upbringing. And then they suddenly came back, which to my own dismay kind of sucked. And at the yeah. same time, I'll tell you from my perspective, I wouldn't give it up despite the heartache and everything that comes with having a full emotional yeah. spectrum because it does connect me to life and to beauty and all that crap. But uh -huh. I also um, don't think it's necessarily a black and white issue and that's why because you know if you're an empathic person you're always going to be like fuck the narcissist i think it's a little more complex and well and not necessarily so not all uh, invariably actually most empaths don't say fuck the narcissist indeed because of their empathic traits they fall into i feel sorry for the narcissist it must be awful having that existence now i don't want anybody's pity but i do understand why empaths think that way because i listen to them often enough and i observe them in actual fact those, em those supposed empaths that go around saying, fuck the narcissist, they're most likely mid-range narcissists. Empaths don't behave that way. <laughs> yes, occasionally they might get their knickers in a twist about something because they've suffered an erosion of their emotional empathy caused by the fact they've been abused so they can lash out. But when that emotional empathy has come back, they don't go round saying, I'm an empath, I'm a super empath, I'm going to take down all the narcissists in the world. Right. Empaths don't do that. Right. They look within themselves. They're quiet. Right. They go about their ministrations in a quiet way. And I know there'll be one or two listening who will think, no, no, you're wrong about that. I'm not wrong. Those that yeah. beat the drum and shout about the fact that I'm a super empath, that I took down the narcissist right. by doing this, this, and this, and I kicked his ass, and I fucked him over, and so on. That's a mid-range narcissist, maybe even a lesser, right. and they don't know what they are. I have had plenty of involvement with narcissists, and the majority of my readers and listeners are empathic individuals, and they don't behave that way. There is a role for empaths. Otherwise, who else would I feed upon? Sure, I can feed upon other narcissists, and I do. And I enjoy fucking over narcissists. And I do that on behalf of my readers when I advise them. And I integrate, uh, interact rather with normals. But empaths serve a purpose because they're the best ones for catering to the prime aims. So much as it um, sticks in my craw to admit it, we need empaths. And the very thing that we despise for its weakness and mm. its patheticness, we are reliant upon. It's a, symbiotic, it's a symbiotic relationship, and empaths do serve a purpose within certain aspects of the world. I always maintain that if I was in a life-threatening position and I had to have surgery, I'd want a narcissistic, I want a, a surgeon who is a narcissist and an empath, empathic uh, nurse. He wouldn't give a fuck about what I think. He wouldn't want to look good. And he'd save my life. She'd uh, nurse me with all of the empathic traits, and she can soup and soothe my fevered brow. <laughs> very very interesting you are a fascinating guy man i um i gotta be honest i do feel pity i can't help it man and at the same time i'm trying to broaden my horizons on what it's like on the other side because like i said yeah. there's shades of gray it's not just black and white everything you said is absolutely correct about they're not there are going to be the narcissists that are like let's fucking kill the narcissist not it, empathic mm -hmm. people do not behave that way they feel sad and what's amazing about you is that you have so much obvious intelligence you are um weaponizing impasse and by the way listeners you can go hg's addressed this a million times you can go to his website and his videos to understand why he does what he does we're not going to spend you know 20 minutes getting into that he's answered it a million times but i can't help but think all these abilities you have, HG, and you utilize them in a quote unquote evil way. Everybody must ask why, 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 right? And and on that note, before we end off here, because I guess we're on the hour, could you just real briefly ask me 
how many people you've had in your life on your website and in your own life that think they can heal you and, and have actually made an attempt to go for it? Oh, wow. It's, uh, it's many more than I can count on my two hands. Um, there are, of course, people that come along who interact with me through the blog, and these fall into two camps. There are the empaths who say, I wish that you could be healed, but they don't try because they, they I have read my work or listened to my videos and they understand that that can't be done. It doesn't stop them expressing the sentiment that they want to be able to help, that they wish it was different. Many people say to me, I, I really like you. I wish you weren't a narcissistic psychopath. Well, I am. So there we are to keep your distance. But this is a typical empathic response of, and particularly when, for instance, I tell them about what's happened in my past when I was a child. And they say, I'm so sorry for what happened to you. And I go, why? You didn't do it. It's happened. There we are. It's a fact. But again, that's the empath in them. The ones that come along through the blog, and these individuals, of course, who don't know me, who talk about, you know, I want to heal, I want to change you again, tend to be mid-range narcissists. They don't recognize the boundary. They think they've got a sense of entitlement to interact with me, and they don't actually know who I am. Now, it's different in my real life because there the empaths are dealing with me and they know who I am. And there have been repeated ones that have sought to fix what they see as damaged. And it's understandable. They're empaths. Thanks for telling me that. I've, I've, I've been curious about how many um, empaths and or narcissists, I guess, quote unquote, throw themselves at you on the daily. <laughs> <laughs> well, very, um, and then again, everybody thinks it's exhausting being you and having to, you know. Not at all. This yeah. Is how I'm, how, how how I'm is designed. This? Is, is this exhausting being the shark? No, it's not. Because it's the shark is the shark. Exactly. It, uh, and again, people say it must be exhausting being a narcissist. It's exhausting to you guys because you're not narcissists. But to us, it's not. Um, that, there'll be narcissists that claim that they're exhausted. Oh, my difficult life, etc. Middle, mid-range type B, pity play. No, on another occasion, I'll tell you more about the instances where individuals, that uh, the, the distinction between the narcissists that come along and the empaths and the different ways that they interact, because that's very useful to help people understand the differences between them. So mm -hmm. um, make a note of that for our next conversation. That is the position that many people that come along they express the desire that they wish it could be another way. And I understand that, right. but they have to recognize there is no hope for that, because as I always explain, hope's a false mistress. And you should never rely upon her. Well said. And there you go with the charm again, allowing me to possibly have a third interview with you. You, you dog. I, I, I would <laughs> love to ever you know get enough want, time you know to answer you. Want you. To. I you can't know help it. I, 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 I feel your pull, my <laughs> You've honed your craft, your dark art very well. Indeed. Indeed. <laughs> I'm, I'm sat here with my marionette of you, Doug, pulling the strings right away. I've made a little and Doug it's working. here. It's working. Yes, it's working. I'm it's working, you, you bastard. Give, yes, give HG another interview. So there we are. No, I'd be delighted to do that. I, we will arrange to do that in the, in the not-too-distant future. And I know that my listeners uh, very much enjoyed the uh, first interview that we had, and so uh, you should uh, take credit for that. I give you the credit. You're the one that has the information. I really, really yeah. appreciate it, HG. It is an honor to yeah. talk to you. And before we end off, could you please tell the listeners exactly what services you provide? I'm going to leave links in the description so they can go to everything that we talked about here. But could you please tell them where they can go to avail themselves of your info? Certainly. If you want to avail yourself of my help and, and join the many, many people who have and have achieved freedom and happiness as a consequence of that, if you go to my blog, NARC site, that's N-A-R-C-S-I-T-E dot com, and you find the menu bar there, you'll see a range of services that are provided. I provide people with email consultations. So if you're a little bit hesitant about speaking to me, and I understand some people are, then you can deal with it uh, on a written basis, or you can speak to me, and I will resolve the issues that you have through that. Uh, I also provide detectors. So if you query, am I the narcissist? I'm not sure, and you want to find out whether you are one or not, you undertake the empath detector test. If there's somebody you think is a narcissist and you want the assurance of whether they are one or not, 
use an arc detector. And there's a range of products and services on there. And my knowledge vault also has a huge array of easy access material, which you can uh, pay for and download automatically, which covers many, many different aspects of the narcissistic dynamic and some entertaining stuff in there as well, because uh, entertaining education is always valuable also. So it's all in there. Do avail yourselves of it. And I look forward to helping you all. And thank you very much, Doug, for the opportunity to speak to you today. And I look forward to doing so on the next occasion. Thank you, HG, and thanks for all the hard work you do. And also, my emotional thinking tells me I can't wait to talk to you again, and my logic says stay away. However, <laughs> since, we're talking, since we're talking about the internet, okay. we're you're, safe. You're we're right. safe, and I want to. I want people like you to know you work a hell of a lot harder at at it than I do. But I'm, I value your what you're talking about. I think it's one of the most, if not the most, important subject on the planet. And I, again, I really, really appreciate you giving me your time. You're most welcome. No problem at all. Thank you. Take care, HG.